activists. This meeting is being recorded. We're going to record. There we go. Um, okay, so GDM is a collective, like I said, of passionate data activists, and we are on a mission to modernize the world. Yeah, we do this in one of two ways. The first is that we have Great Data Minds Innovation Labs. This is where we do our projects. This is strategic planning, education, the deployment of these data projects. And that can be done either in-house or in our clients' environments or in our newly launched um, Innovation Lab environment. And then on the other side of the house, that's our greatdataminds.com site. And this is where we are creating content and hosting great events just like this one today with transformational thought leaders and technologies. Um, a little bit of housekeeping. As you can see, this is a meeting on Zoom. So your cameras and microphones can be on at your command and we would love to hear from you. We welcome you to pipe in with questions, um, conversation. But if you're more um, comfortable using the chat or you've got a link to share or something like that, you can certainly do it there as well. We really do encourage collaboration um, in an event like this. And uh, we'll also save a little bit of time at the end for a formal Q and A. So if we wanna just kind of Watch the Ian show as we go. Um, we can do that. And then at the end, there'll be some space for questions as well. And so today we are super excited to join hands once again with our stellar partners at Data Robot. Um, and we have one of our very favorites, Ian Cox is joining us today. Of course, Nicole is on here. I don't want to um, discredit that she is on here as well. She's my uh, kind of marketing um, partners uh, counterpart over on that side of things. And um, Ian here is our customer facing data scientist in channel partnerships at Data Robot. He is driven and a self-directed analytics professional with expertise in applying data science and machine learning to derive value, generate insights, and solve problems. Uh, fun fact, Ian has also been playing the piano since he was about six years old. I found that from the last time I gave you an, uh, an introduction, Ian, and I think that's fantastic because on the great data mind side of things, we have Mike Lampa, who is our chief analytics officer here at uh, GDM, and Mike is an excellent guitar player. So yeah, I think awesome. part two, so the next one, the, the next one, we're one gonna have is, music. it's going to be a jam session. So yeah, when we'll we re-invite you to this, yeah, it's going to be a full conference. It'll be a happy hour conference. I mean, concert, mm -hmm. and we'll just listen mm -hmm. in. Um, exactly. And then also from the great that, data mind side of the house. Oh, sorry. Is that, a, is that a ukulele mic or is that a regular? <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't put it past him. It, it would primarily be regular guitar, Tim, and a little bit of bass. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> um, and then with, uh, I don't know about any musical talent that she may or may not have, but it's our very own CEO's Julie Burroughs. Oh. That, that was lovely. Yeah. She's an accomplished dancer. <laughs> I can attest to that. She can, can dance. dance. So <laughs> then maybe Julie, you and I, and then I don't know about you, Nicole, but we could be like the backup dancers to like uh, any Ian show. Yeah, just put me uh, way in the back as the backup dancer. <laughs> oh, Julie will lead us. I've seen her elbow her way to the front of the dance floor already. Mm -hmm. Like last week, I saw that. She goes, so. she goes to the mash pit. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right. Well, yeah, that, that's kind of it. At, like I said, as we go from here, we'll be manning the chat. If you have any questions or anything I can help you with along the way, you just go ahead and, um, and put it right in there. But uh, Mike, I will uh, turn the floor to you to take it away, sir. All right. Thank you. I'm going to share my screen for just a moment. Uh, let me know when you can see it. We got it. All right. And let me hide this. There we go. So I just want to um, offer up some opening comments and some positioning, um, starting with uh, when we do our, our uh, executive workshops around the depth to modern analytics, um, we do quite a bit of research. And uh, this one is very applicable that the, the AI spending is on a really rapid rate of um, acceleration. And it started um, during 2019, it, it accelerated uh, greatly during 2020 and continues in 2021 and in 2022. And you can see that number. I mean, that's just the spend side of it. From a value side, I think McKinsey um, estimates that AI in and of itself is going to generate somewhere in the neighborhood of seven to ten trillion dollars in value to organizations across uh, the globe. Um, but Many of the leaders are still struggling, um, even though they, they see the technology 
the, the AI efforts being one of the most important digital transformations. It's a tough transformation. And you know, you, you can see from you know, Accenture's research and perspective, um, failing to scale AI is going to put companies out of business. And we're already seeing that from some of the research that came out from McKinsey of the people that have doubled down in their AI spend are widening the gap in their markets and, and leaving the laggards behind. Um, we're a huge advocate of self-service. Um, and Julie, I think you'll attest to that. And self-service analytics, self-service data prep. We also include self-service um, um, machine learning and artificial uh, intelligence or augmented intelligence. We want to enable the citizen data scientists. And that has been contentious. Um, the few, first few times, Julie, I know one of our closest um, advisors that is a machine learning specialist, um, her first reaction was, oh, I'm not into this whole citizen data science thing. I think there's gonna be some trouble. But Julie, what's her, what's her quote now? Yeah, she was sitting next to me at our last data robot hands-on and she goes, everyone that has Excel on their desktop should have data robot on their desktop. And I'm not kidding. And I went, whoa, what, mm -hmm. where did that change of heart come from? Yeah, I spun my head around. I was like, what did she just say? I know. I know. <laughs> um, and I'm excited to hear somebody that has been running a data science team for a while and is, is really uh, of a pedigree, has many pedigrees around it, is seeing the value of it. And Data Robot is our partner to enable that to happen. Um, but it comes with some awareness uh, because governance is really starting to lean in on machine learning algorithms. Um, there's a lot of uh, um, uh, regulations that are being uh, presented uh, and going through uh, the formal process to get passed uh, around uh, holding companies accountable for the ethical use of their machine learning algorithms. Um, so when you go into machine learning, we have to make sure all of our feature engineering and, and model algorithms are fair by design. Um, I love this quote, expectations, a powerful guide to action. What that is talking to is when a data scientist sits down and say, okay, I'm, gonna, I'm going to solve this problem or enable this opportunity through my machine learning model. And I've got a bias on what I'm looking for that model to predict for me by design. Or I'm sorry, just that, that intention creates bias. And the, the point that we're making here with these bullets is throughout the model process, uh, the machine learning development and deployment process, you have to constantly think about inclusion and diversity. You have to constantly make sure that you're aware of and sensitive to the potential of undesirable bias sneaking into your algorithm logic and or in the data that's being served. Um, McKinsey talks to, as you get into doing more and more machine learning, they're saying extend your enterprise risk management um, function and discipline to include model risk management. And as you see, they're talking about going through three stages. Uh, I'm not going to read all the bullets, but the whole goal here is to make sure that we have a deliberate process in place for ensuring that we got the right um, ethics and the right testing methods and the right auditability and observability of those machine learning models. Um, so uh, we can finally get to stage three, which we're, where we're actually monitoring, capturing the value. Um, North America banks are a little bit further ahead than the European peers, um, but they, they chart, they, they um, are pioneering this effort around model risk management. Another thing you need to consider in your organization, because it's much more than that statistical mathematical algorithm sitting in the middle there. When we get into machine learning, um, the whole life cycle, there's all these other things that have to be taken into consideration. It's not just the code. Okay? Um, and over time, you have to develop a maturity around your machine learning apps because we're extending data apps. We're going beyond data warehousing and um, analytic visualization and whatnot. Um, there's another whole last mile that we have to put in place and there's a maturity level to get there where you have a fully automated and fully observable um, machine learning uh, maturity in your organization, <laughs> including um, at um, you know, level, uh, level two there, um, the deliberate creation and um, care and nurturing of a feature store. And then the machine learning metadata store, there's all sorts of telemetry 
that needs to be produced during the execution of your machine learning model so that you can observe and, and detect drift. Okay, and why is my screen not moving ahead? <laughs> all right, that's all I got to say about it. That's why it's not moving ahead. So we're really excited when you're, what you're about to see from data we're about really addresses these maturity levels. It, it addresses this whole life cycle. It addresses the, the enablement of risk management and it does indeed enable the, the citizen data scientist. So with that, Ian, I believe I'm gonna turn it over to you, sir. Thanks very much, Mike. Mm -hmm. And uh, thank you to the Great Data Minds team for inviting me to this event. I'm really excited to show everybody um, a demo of Data Robot today. Just a little bit about myself. I am a customer facing data scientist at Data Robot. I've been with the company for about a year now. Prior to joining Data Robot, I worked as a statistician in the nonprofit uh, field for about a decade. Um, I built a lot of models manually before. And um, when I first saw Data Robot, I was pretty blown away in terms of the um, increased capabilities it would give me as a statistician um, to really kind of accelerate the whole machine learning pipeline. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen and kind of introduce you to first the content of what we're going to be covering today and also a overview of data robot and then we'll get into the demo. So let's go ahead and share my screen. Um, so the first things first, we're going to be covering uh, four different sections today. Um, we're going to be covering data preparation. Um, which is going to save you time wrangling data and organizing that data to prep it for machine learning. Next, we're going to talk about the actual automated machine learning process mm -hmm. here, uh, which can democratize AI. So any type of user, regardless of their background, can build highly accurate and explainable machine learning models. Then we are going to be talking about ML ops. Um, so ops teams and engineering teams can have confidence in machine learning apps running reliably in produ production. And finally, I'm going to introduce you to a resource that is free um, that Data Robot provides called Pathfinder, and that contains solution accelerators that can help you really um, get more value from whatever data you currently have. Um, and what I'd like to do first here before I dig in is um, kind of pose the question to the chat, um, you know, on a scale from one to five, one being, I don't know anything about data robot and five being, I know a lot about data robot. I've seen it before. I understand its capabilities. If the chat wouldn't just mind um, popping in a one to five, uh, you know, temperature read of how you, um, have been introduced to data robot so far. That would be helpful for me um, to kind of tailor the message today. So let's see what we have here. Okay, so we have some fives, we have some ones. So kind of, um, okay, we have some people who are very familiar, some people who haven't seen much of data robot. And uh, I think my goal today is to fix that. So hopefully everybody mm -hmm. is above a one at the end of today, but we'll see, we'll see. Okay. So um, we're gonna start today with a high level overview of what Data Robot is. And that is what the slide here is um, depicting. So Data Robot is an enterprise AI cloud solution that brings all of the different types of users, no matter what your background is, together under one platform. So this is a single platform for all different types of users, from the people who create AI systems like data scientists or analysts, to the people who operate and maintain those AI systems and the technology stack involved with it, like engineers or DevOps. And then finally to the business stakeholders who will actually consume those predictions made with AI. Data Robot makes it easy for any user, no matter what your background is, to get involved and collaborate in this machine learning pipeline. There's something for every different type of persona in this platform. The second key thing to understand about Data Robot are the unified end-to-end -end automated capabilities. You can source raw data, you can clean it up, you can create custom features, go through the modeling process to build and evaluate and understand machine learning models. Then you can deploy those models into production and obviously monitor their health over time. And you can also create AI applications 
which end users can use to actually consume those model predictions. And along this entire path from raw data to value, the platform is going to provide the capability to do a huge amount of the heavy lifting involved with every single one of those steps. Next, DataRobot operates on a foundation of trust. There are no black boxes in this platform because everything is governed and explainable. Whether it's simply understanding model predictions, the ability to govern your process workflows, easily accessible automatically generated compliance documentation, or even the option to introduce humility into how the predictions are being made by the system. The trust and explainability aspects of machine learning are incredibly important for DataRobot. And quite frankly, the users of this platform are entitled to know how every single step of the machine learning lifecycle is working. Next, you can take data, uh, data from any source. Uh, DataRobot specializes in multimodal data. This platform is going to provide you with the ability to combine visual information like images, geospatial data, time series data, and of course, your traditional tabular data like numeric and categorical values, even free form unstructured text data. You can bring all this data together in a unified way, and really that allows you to hopefully achieve new levels of predictive power and insight from whatever data that you do currently have. And then, and then finally, finally, we believe that customers should have the ability to leverage a wide variety of platform deployment options. From being able to run in cloud environments like AWS, Google Cloud Platform, or Azure, or the ability to run on premises, or even in hybrid modes where specific parts of the workflow are operating in different environments, kind of like a federated uh, setup. Or if you'd like us to run all of the infrastructure for you, we also offer a public cloud environment for everyone to take advantage of. And really at DataRobot, we want to democratize data science. And this AI cloud platform is going to empower the different personas to do more than ever and really supercharge that entire end-to-end -end machine learning lifecycle. And really at DataRobot, we want to make sure we are helping you and your customers solve highly impactful business needs uh, by providing that platform that allows you to quickly build and deploy highly accurate and explainable models. So today, we are going to be walking you through a machine learning project, and the data that we're going to be using is a data set from an e-commerce company that contains information relating to customer accounts and the results of if those accounts churned. And we are going to use this historical data of customer churn to predict if existing customers are likely to churn. And why are we doing this? You know, what, what is the business purpose here? Well. Churn is a uh, very costly customer retention problem in many different industries. The cost to acquire a new customer is many times greater than retaining an existing customer. So the companies that can predict churn likelihood are going to be able to address those customers, and that in turn can increase subscription rates, improve those retention numbers, and really, you know, it's going to improve the bottom line, as well as give the business a better understanding of why their customers are even churning to begin with. Mm -hmm. And we are going to uh, show you just how easy it is today uh, to achieve that result using DataRobot's AI cloud platform. And before I actually hop into the platform, I did want to uh, provide everybody with a link to the data set. If you are interested, I am dropping it into chat right here. Um, this is a box link, so you don't need to even need a box account. You can um, access that link and we can follow along with the data set. So um, next, we are going to be hopping into the DataRobot AI Cloud platform. And our first step here is um, the actual data prep process. But before I talk about what data prep looks like, um, what I do want to mention um, is that we have many different data connectors here. So you can easily ingest data from um, wherever it is stored uh, into the data robot platform before we can actually build a model we need to access that data needed to train the model and having many different data connectors right out of the box is a huge benefit it's really going to make it easy to tie those different data sources together and there can be a lot when you're working with a real world project 
So once you actually access your data from wherever it's stored, um, you get to see it in a tabular-like interface um, where, when you open that data set. Um, and you can easily see the raw values in each one of these columns. Um, and if we quickly look at some of the columns in our data set, we have a customer ID column, we have some demographic information about the customers, information about if they're a loyalty member or how many days since their last purchase, what their most recent purchase was, and so on and so forth. There's actually a good amount of information here about historical accounts, and the result of if those counts churned is contained in all the way to the right, um, where we have this column here called is dormant. This true false column, this binary column, is going to let us know if any of these customers churned or not. And this is going to be uh, what we are trying to predict once we actually get to uh, machine learning. Um, so we've explored this data kind of at a high level. Um, what I want to show you next, if we scroll back here, is um, this is the data section, but we also have the steps section here. Um, and the steps are essentially a script of all of the different data transformation or processing steps um, that have been applied to change this data in, in some way. Um, and really, you know, if we start at the bottom, we have our raw data set that we ingested. That's the data set that I shared with you all in the chat. And every single step above that is a modification or change to this data that we've performed to enrich it and get it in a better place for machine learning. Oftentimes, the data that we do have is not in a perfect form for machine learning yet. And uh, that's why you need to, you know, sometimes do a little bit of data enrichment or modification uh, before you actually get to machine learning. Now, each one of these steps here is actually one of the tools uh, that we uh, have in the tools section. And we can uh, do things like highlight patterns and ranges for each of our uh, steps. We can also, if we want, write native Spark SQL here. This is an environment where if you don't have a coding background, you can easily manipulate and change these steps in a no-code way. Um, you can perform steps like uh, aggregations, deduplications, uh, find and replace. There's all sorts of uh, different types of data transformations that are needed here. And not only do we provide the ability to do that in a user interface by clicking around, but if you are SQL savvy, you can absolutely write Spark SQL right here to achieve that same result using code. And really, this value prop is that with just a couple of clicks, you can perform some very powerful transformations on this data. And automating these steps is going to put valuable time back in the hands of team members who are working on data prep. And these easy to use functions, these are a big differentiator for data robot. But it's great to be able to perform these steps like we saw here. Uh, but at your place of work, there might be many different people working on data prep. And what data robot has done is make governance easy by controlling who has access to um, collaborate and manipulate and modify any of these steps. So for example, if you had a different team of analysts and then data scientists, you can separate the permissions for each one of those teams. And that's going to allow you to ensure that people who uh, should have access to the data or um, can't change any project steps that anything um, you know might mess up that data process. But hypothetically, let's say a change was made on accident by someone. It's going to happen. It happens everywhere. Um, and this might be a change to some essential data cleaning step or similar. Versioning is built right into uh, visual data prep. So you can see here that I'm actually on about the 26th version of this project here. And if I wanted to, I could uh, annotate any of these versions and go back in time. So if someone did make a change on accident, we could easily revert back to a previous state that would prevent that um, change from becoming permanent. Then finally, you can set up a project flow that will essentially um, automate this whole process in an orchestrated fashion. Let's say you have new records hit your database every Monday. You can set up a project workflow that will essentially every Monday ingest data from your data source, perform these steps like we've seen here to modify or change the data in uh, however way we wish. And then we can publish that workflow uh, maybe we want to pipe it back to a database of record. Maybe we want to visualize that information. Or 
if we want, we could actually push it to data robot to generate inference. So if we want to find out which, um, which, which customers are likely to churn, then we could write that right back to data robot. Now, this is going to help you govern that data prep process easily. And once you have established your workflow, um, you can easily push your data set to any number one of those sources. Um, so at this point, we've seen kind of the summary of the data prep section of the product. Um, we're going to be moving next into the platform uh, where we can actually build machine learning models. Um, so here, we're at the point in the demo where we're at the data robot landing page. Um, now we have our data that we cleaned up in visual data prep, um, and we're going to use that to train machine learning models to predict customer churn. Um, but if let's say we hadn't done that previously, if you had a CSV or a Excel file or, um, a, you know, a, a, SAS file or geolocation file, you can actually drag in many different various file types right into this platform um, to start building machine learning projects. And I showed you on the last screen that we have a target column in our database called is dormant. And that has a true false result if someone did churn or they did not churn. And in machine learning, we call that a binary classification problem. But data robot doesn't just support binary classification problems. Uh, we also support regression and clustering and anomaly detection, and of course, time series regression and classification and multi class classification as well. So um, there's a lot of functionality built in here, and it's the same unified experience you get for no matter what type of machine learning problem you're trying to solve. Now, Today, I have actually uh, put that data that we cleaned up in Visual Data Prep in Data Robot's AI catalog. And the AI catalog is basically just a repository of data sets to be used for machine learning. So we are going to click the AI catalog here. And then I'm going to search for my churn data set. And I am going to select our churn data set here. And we're going to go ahead and create a project. So. Um, at this point, we have told Data Robot what data set we want to use for machine learning. Um, now, the first thing that happens once you import a data set into Data Robot is the platform is going to determine the data types. It is going to perform a first pass of exploratory data analysis, and that will in turn generate for us data quality assessment. Sorry, was there a question? I don't know what that was. I, I don't know what that sound was. <laughs> <laughs> or maybe we do know what that sound was. Okay. I was on mute. <laughs> no pointing fingers. Every, it happens to everybody. All good. Um, so we've imported our data set into Data Robot. And you can see there are a couple of steps that happened here. We've read this raw data and we've done a little bit of exploratory data analysis on that. Now, exploratory data analysis, EDA, is something that as a data scientist, whenever you encounter a new data set, you have to perform this exercise. And this is a time consuming process. If you have a large data set that you're working with, um, it takes quite a bit of time to summarize any data quality issues that can be inherent in your data. And what Data Robot has done is automate that for you by providing this data quality assessment. So the state of quality assessment here is a summary of issues that are inherent to our data set that we've uploaded, our churn data set. And it's letting us know um, if any of these problems that it's noticed could affect machine learning. So you can see uh, in our assessment here, we have a couple columns that are zero inflated. We have excess zeros. And then we also have this notification here that there are outliers in five of our features. And this message here that says consider handling them when using linear models. Basically, linear models have an expectation that there is uniformity in that data and there is um, there, there aren't any outliers. So depending on which algorithm you use for machine learning, these data quality issues might be problematic. However, Data Robot not only tells you about these data quality issues, but once we start modeling, Data Robot will actually perform additional steps to ensure that the problems these issues inherent in our data could potentially create won't impact the quality of models that are produced. So this is the summarization of our exploratory data analysis here, but I also want to show you that 
uh, here, is our, here are all our features that we, we had um, in our data set. And if we click into any of these, we can actually see a visual distribution of values here, as well as me measures of central tendency and variance. So we have the number of unique var uh, variables in this age, uh, the number missing, what the mean standard deviation, uh, median min max are. And when you think about executing this type of visual or investigating this type of stat um, on a single feature, that is going to be a time consuming process at scale. So when you actually are encountering a data set that might be 100 columns wide, 1000 columns wide, this becomes a very time consuming process. So uh, having the ability to simply drop a data set into data robot and immediately start understanding what's going on with that data is a huge benefit to the speed of the machine learning lifecycle. So now that I've showed you that um, you can investigate any of these features, um, and let me show you just one more here. This is a categorical feature, gender. So we have um, a data set that has mostly females here, but we also have a good number of males. Um, and again, it, if you see an incorrect variable, um, uh, data type here. Let's say this was a um, categorical variable, but it's actually a numeric variable. You can actually use this uh, little drop down here to change the variable type. So um, there's a lot of power here in customization. It isn't just, oh, well, this is what data robot thinks. You can, you can fine tune the expectation here. Um, but again, our use case today is to predict whether a customer will actually churn or not. And the column in our data set that contains that result is called is dormant. And so we're gonna scroll up to the top of the screen here and type in is dormant as the uh, target that we want to actually predict. Now, um, once we have identified our target, you can see a highlight of our target variable, that distribution of values of mostly falses, which means most of our customers are not churning, but we also have a good number of customers that did churn. Um, so once we have selected our target, you can see that distribution of values and data robot is also suggested an optimization metric that will work well with our machine learning for this, uh, for this type of model. And obviously everybody has probably noticed the enormous start button in the top center of the screen. Um, after we've set the target, we can uh, tell data robot to go off and running, building many different machine learning models. Um, but one thing that I do think is uh, quite important to mention here before I press start is data robot has an enormous amount of advanced uh, options here in terms of how you want to fine tune the build of uh, this modeling process. So if I click on the advanced options, there are all sorts of options here for uh, partitioning. And um, if there's a time series aspect to your data, you can control a lot of um, that. You can also enforce monotonicity constraints and so on and so forth. But one feature that I do think is incredibly important here, and um, Mike touched upon this before he passed it over to me, is the ability to govern your models in terms of bias. So the bias and uh, fairness feature in Data Robot essentially allows you to define what types of protected features are being used in your data. And then it allows you to ensure that any predictions made from the model don't artificially favor any individual protected class. And this is very important because unbiased and fair models are going to be uh, something that all industries that deal with PII and sensitive data are going to be insistent about. And using Data Robot, you have that capability built right in to ensure that you are um, not only handling that, but you're way ahead of those conversations with guaranteeing fair and equal outcomes with AI. So to show you what this looks like, really you type in which protected features you uh, have in your data set. For our example today, we might wanna use something like age or gender. Um, then we can uh, essentially say, what is our favorable outcome? And our favorable outcome for is dormant is, um, we, we don't want churn, so that would be false here. And then we have a little wizard that allows you and guides you through the process of ensuring fair and equal outcomes uh, with your uh, AI. So if you want equal representation or equal error, you can make that choice. Same thing with, uh, do you want your uh, models based on the uh, 
binary decisions or do you want it to be on the raw prediction scores and all of these questions here depending on your answers have links to our documentation so we have a lot of additional detail about bias and fairness here but after you've answered these questions data robot recommends a suggested fairness metric for you with an explanation of why it has made that choice and again all of this is accessible in our documentation here so if you do want to dive deeper into why um, the the uh, suggestion is a certain way or just to educate yourself in general on how to make AI models more fair, um, it's a great resource here with our documentation. So um, let us visit, revisit this giant button in the uh, top center of the screen here and actually go ahead and kick off our machine learning process. So let's click the start button and uh, see what happens next. And while Data Robot is off and running, and you can see there's a number of steps that have been uh, added to our status queue here, um, let's recap what we've done so far. So far, we have imported this data to model, and we've selected the target that we want to predict. A lot of solutions out there require a very huge learning curve and an enormous amount of practice to get off the ground and running. And you're going to see right now just how easy it is to start building highly accurate models um, using machine learning and data robot. Now, there are a couple steps that happen after pressing start. There's gonna be a second pass of exploratory data analysis, and that will show us the feature importance here. The data is also going to be split into different partitions for training the model and validating the model. There are going to be different featureization methods leveraged for our different data types. And then finally, there are many different machine learning models that are going to be evaluated against our data. And all of that happens after we press start. You'll see on the right side of the screen the number of project workers. And you can think of workers as essentially virtual machines that you can leverage to perform steps like building many different models in parallel. Think of workers as adding additional data scientists or people power to work on a project and perform all these steps that you're seeing here simultaneously. And really overall, uh, Quick Start helps speed up the modeling process for data scientists, for citizen data scientists, analysts, whoever is using it, by automating a lot of the time intensive, repetitive tasks of prepping data robot for modeling. So. Data robot, I would have to emphasize here, we support the notion of the customer uh, or the, uh, the citizen data scientist, but data robot can also put valuable time back in the hands of whoever you have building models, uh, whether that be a, a veteran data scientist or a machine learning engineer as well. Um, it's gonna greatly enhance the scalability of anybody um, contributing to the machine learning pipeline. Now, I will also mention here that if you are a code first data scientist and you want to live in your IDE of choice all day, um, I, I, I definitely uh, resonate with that type of persona. Um, if you want to build your models manually, um, we also offer an API that allows you to perform all of the steps that you are seeing in the UI in API. Um, so. Uh, this is uh, very important here to mention that it's also uh, available in Python and R. Um, so if you really wanted to uh, have a code first approach, you can replicate all of the processes that we're doing in the UI today in the API as well. Um, other solutions that are out there, they require you to work exclusively in code or exclusively in a UI. Uh, but with DataRobot, you get the option to do both. And we've gotten plenty of feedback that even very advanced data scientists do like working in the UI. Um, it's very intuitive. There's a huge amount of guidance built right in for the many options that are available in the product. And Data Robot really offers that unique combination of the ability to get going quickly with any type of machine learning project, while also allowing for that full granular and control and customization for those who are more knowledgeable about the machine learning process. So um, let me switch back to the screen here and, and show you that uh, this is still processing here. I'm not using all of my workers for this project, but if you wanted to speed up the process, you could bump up the worker count. And this process takes about 20 minutes to complete. So um, let me switch over to a completed version of the same project that use our same uh, customer churn data set. And I wanna show you what the platform has come up with. 
So let's switch to a completed project here. Um, and the first thing that I want to point out here is the uh, feature importance of the model. And hold on, I, I see there's a question in uh, chat here. Will it export the project in Python? So yes, we can absolutely support uh, or export that project in Python. Not all model algorithms available in the product are exportable via Python. We have some algorithms that are exportable via Docker as well as Java. So uh, to answer your question, Lance, yes, we can export the uh, projects in Python. Good question. Um, okay, so uh, where was I? Feature importance. So feature importance here, you can see this new column on our uh, data page, and we have a new sorting of our columns in our, in our data set. So this importance column here is a way of evaluating the nonlinear correlation with individual features in our data set with our target variable. It's a great way to start understanding which features are likely to impact our model itself. Um, and if we look at what features that DataRobot has identified as important here, you can see that the number of purchases in the last year, their days since their previous purchase, how much time they spend on the website and the number of website visits, these are our most important features within the context of our is dormant variable here. But this is a univariate evaluation. There's a lot more that we can dig into here. If we wanted to see the interactions between features and other features, we can navigate to the feature associations section. And this is going to show us a correlation matrix that tells us which features are similar to one another that might have similar levels of predictive power, um, might be a redundant features in there. And it's also going to show us um, clusters of different features and uh, different feature associations here. We can see here um, we have our summarized top 10 strongest associations. Um, and you can see that the most recent purchases and re recent purchases are similar, as well as the number of website visits and how much time they spent on the website. So you can see that DataRobot has automatically identified some clusters of similar features we have in our data set, as well as summarized for us their predictive power. Now that we have actually investigated our features here, um, let's jump over to the model leaderboard. And I wanna show you what DataRobot has come up with for the actual machine learning portion of this exercise. So we are switching now to the models section. And um, what we're looking at here <clears throat> is essentially what we call the model leaderboard. And the model leaderboard is a survival of the fittest competition between different machine learning algorithms, both open source and proprietary algorithms. You can see that there's Python algorithms here, extreme gradient boosted models. Um, we have R models. Um, we have data robot proprietary models. There's a huge amount of models available in the product. When you talk about the sheer breadth of modeling algorithm, algor algorithmic, excuse me, approaches, uh, there are a ton. If we go to the model repository, um, there's actually a huge amount of different models that we can leverage here. If you are a seasoned data scientist and you're used to working with a particular algorithm and you want to see how that algorithm compares with anything else that's on the leaderboard, all you'd have to do is select which algorithm you want to add and select which feature list you want, and then it will add that to the leaderboard right there. Um, so Again, this is a <clears throat> survival of the fittest competition between different machine learning algorithms. And the way this works is small amounts of training data are fed to different modeling algorithms. The algorithms that perform well on small amounts of data are then fed more data. And that process is going to continue until a top model is evaluated against all of the data. And you know we have a many different uh, modeling algorithms here. You can see that uh, DataRobot built 50 different models just with one click to start the modeling process. Um, it's very powerful <laughs> uh, that you can uh, get that amount of insight and uh, try many different approaches there with just one click to start the modeling process. And really, if you are just getting started with your AI journey, or you have a resource bottleneck due to capacity, building one model might be a very time-consuming process. 
And having the ability and the capability to quickly iterate through the modeling process and try many different approaches here, it's going to allow you to scale quickly and tackle that backlog. No other platform or tool allows you to perform all of the pre-processing steps and try as many different modeling algorithms as quickly and easily as DataRobot. Now, I will mention that our models on this leaderboard are ranked by our optimization metric, which is log loss for this um, binary classification model. Um, and we can see that all these uh, models are, are uh, ranked by how well they're doing with our log loss score. But what if we want more information about any of our models here? We, we understand that this model here has a good log loss score, but what if we want to understand that at a higher level. Well, you can get that detail by clicking into any model on the model leaderboard. So let's open up our um, top model here. And I want to zoom in and show you um, what we're looking at here. And this is a model blueprint. Now, model blueprints are a way of explaining how this model is working. You start on the left with your raw data set, that customer churn data set that we imported. And then for our different data types, you can see that we had categorical variables and numeric variables. We have different types of featureization methods that have been leveraged. And for those of you who are new to machine learning, what is a featureizer? Well, when you think about one of the columns we investigated earlier, the male and female column, the gender column, um, how would you go, how, go about correlating a, a word or a letter in this case, male or female, to a number, which is the target that we want to actually predict. And that question is what a featureizer is. A featureizer turns non-numeric data and even numeric data sometimes into a form that is understandable by machine learning model algorithm. So what we have here for our different data types is our different Featureizers. So we leveraged an ordinal encoder for our categorical variables, and we fixed any imputed values, or we, we um, imputed missing values here for numeric variables. And after that, both of those some, both of those created features fed into our extreme gradient boosted trees classifier model, which can actually generate a prediction. Now. If you are fuzzy or you are learning for the first time ever um, what any of these steps are on the model leaderboard in the blueprint, um, and you need a refresher on it, you need to understand why it's making uh, you are using this type of featureizer, you can click into any of these um, boxes on the blueprint, and all of those access our model documentation. So if you have an idea about, um, you know, something that you want to change here or you want to see why this mod why this featureizer works the way it does you can come here and get all the information about the background of uh, what this uh, featureizer is doing as well as the parameters that you can change if you should wish now this is very helpful um, because really, you know, there's there can be very complicated blueprints. We are dealing with a data set that only has numeric and categorical values, but you might eventually deal with a data set that has images, or it might have a time element, or there might be unstructured text. And for each one of those different data types, you're going to need a different featureizer. So um, this is a very helpful way to understand how this machine learning uh, is happening with this blueprint. Now. One additional thing I'd like to emphasize here is that these blueprints are customizable. So if you have need for a particular pre-processing step or you would like to build your own blueprint for creating a model, you can absolutely do that by clicking on the copy and edit, and then you can move around and add your own, um, add your own uh, steps to the blueprint here. Now, I mentioned that the models on this leaderboard are ranked based off of our optimization metric, which for this uh, problem today is log loss. Um, so we understand that this model is performing well compared to other models on the leaderboard. But what if we want more detail about how this model is working? We always want more detail. And we know our model has a good log loss score, but what if we want to explain this to another business user, why this works? Well, we can easily get access to that detail by drilling into the Evaluate tab of any model that's on the leaderboard. Now, in the Evaluate section, you can determine how well a model is performing. Um, I will say, and I know we have a varied audience today, 
these evaluate sections do get um, uh, deep with some data science concepts. Uh, so I won't dig in here too much, but I will say it's worth mentioning um, that we have access to the standard evaluation tools in a data science toolkit. So uh, we have our lift chart here, and essentially this is showing the predicted versus actual values bins here. And a good lift chart for a model that's performing well is going to show uh, the predicted and actuals uh, plotted fairly closely together. So you can see that this is performing well. And we also have our um, receiver operating characteristic curve. And this does get a bit dense with data science concepts, but this allows you to determine the threshold between differentiating between predictions, as well as add a payoff matrix. So if you have a particular outcome, the outcome that we're most concerned about identifying here is if a customer will churn or not. We want to weight that outcome heavily. So the machine learning model um, will be heavy handed with that type of identification. We'd rather um, do more to identify a customer that might churn than be safe than sorry and say, oh, well, um, they, they uh, might not churn, so we won't do anything with them. Essentially, this is allowing you to weight the business outcome with a payoff matrix here. And again, this does get a little deep, so I'm not going to cover it in too much depth today. Um, but one thing um, that I kind of wanted to uh, explain about my background is when some of the models that I built previously, um, I would pass those models off to a business user or a uh, non-technical or non-data scientist um, persona. And they quite frankly uh, don't always care too much about how the machine learning model is working. But what everybody wants to understand about machine learning is why a model made a uh, prediction, why the model is making the decisions it's making. Now we get access to that in the understand section. So here is where we come to start understanding for this particular extreme gradient boosted trees classifier model, what features are most influential here. And if we zoom in here, we can see that uh, for this particular modeling algorithm, the number of purchases made within the last year, the days since their previous purchase, how much uh, the purchase amount was their total for the last year, and how much time they spent on the website, as well as age. These are some of our most influential features for this particular machine learning algorithm. Now, this is very important to understand um, at a high level here, but what if we want to see how much influence any of these features have? Well, we can access the feature effects section, and this is going to show us how impactful specific features are. Um, and when we change the underlying values of any of these features, how that changes the model prediction. So I wanted to uh, show the, um, the duration of website minutes here, because I think this is a very interesting visual. So what we have here is on the uh, x-axis, we have the actual duration of time spent on the website. And on the y-axis, we have the prediction if a uh, customer will churn or not. So a uh, low prediction is going to be down here. A high prediction is going to be up here. And what we see with this relationship is that when not a lot of time is spent on the website, there's a much higher chance to churn. The customers that spend a lot of time, 200 plus minutes, 400 plus minutes and so on and so forth um, are going to have a much less likelihood to churn. I cringe to think about how much time I have spent on retail sites in my, in my life. And um, I, I totally agree. The more time, the more interactive a website is, um, the more time you're going to want to spend on it, the more likely you are to buy an item. And that is going to uh, be influential and uh, informative to the business to see this type of relationship. Not only have with one click to start the modeling process, we built a bunch of models, done all of the requirements to uh, get to the point where we can start understanding the models, but we also are generating insight here already, just with one click to start the modeling process. We're understanding what features are likely to impact our model and what type of impact they will have um, in, in the various distribution of that value. Now, finally, the reason that I mentioned the story about the difficulty in explaining uh, machine learning models to a non-technical audience, um, a feature that really would have saved me a lot of time in my past role, is prediction explanations. 
Prediction explanations show the most significant reasons why a model made a specific prediction. And really what we're looking at here, this is um, one of our highest predictions for the customer uh, that's likely to churn. And we have these this impact column. And this impact column is saying the pluses are bumping the likelihood to churn up, the minuses are pushing the likelihood to churn down. And you can see here, we have a lot of pluses on this uh, particular um, this, this particular person, row ID 2667. And if we look at some of the reasons why they have only made one purchase in the last year, they spent a good amount on this purchase, 425, but it was only one purchase. There's been 153 days since their previous purchase. They've only spent 15 minutes on that website. And this is a very transparent and human understandable way of understanding why this model made this particular prediction. And this is scalable to every prediction that's made by Data Robot. If you want to understand what every prediction, um, why every prediction was influenced by this model, what the underlying data told it, you can come here and get access to that here. Now, throughout the demo today, you've kind of seen a theme here that everything that we do in this platform is explainable and documented. Now, if we go to the compliance section, compliance reports are a, a huge differentiator for Data Robot. They are going to document every step in the machine learning process from pre-processing, uh, exploratory data analysis, tuning of hyperparameters, and then of course details about the algorithm actually applied to the data itself. Now, in some industries, you might require documentation of a model before you can put it in production. In heavily regulated industries like finance, there might be fines associated with not having the proper documentation for your modeling process. This automatically generated uh, compliance report is going to massively reduce the time needed to write and document these types of um, initiatives. And this is not only important from a regulatory standpoint, but also from an organizational understanding of how your AI is working. Now, this is about a 40 page document, and it contains all of the modeling steps and the methodology specific to this model. Um, and I'm just going to put it out there. I don't know too many data scientists who actually want to write an exhaustive 40-page uh, conceptual proof in addition to uh, actually building a model. And using DataRobot, you don't have to because this is built right in. Um, I'll also mention that if you would like, these compliance reports are customizable. So if you want to include um, a, a company specific header, maybe a great data mines header there. Um, you can include as much or as little information as you want in these reports. And you can also add things like uh, company specific guidelines or anything similar there. And again, this is a very long document. There's a lot going on here. Um, and we've had a lot of success in our financial sector uh, with regulators really uh, <laughs> appreciating um, the ease of understanding of what's going on with data robot models. And again, this is available for every modeling algorithm that we have available in the product. Now, so far, we have built a model, we've evaluated the model, we started understanding what's influential to this model, and we have compliance documentation for the model. So we're at a pretty good point. And again, I got to iterate that um, we have only uh, clicked one button here to kick off the modeling process. All this was done here uh, for us in an automated way. And at this point, we've evaluated the model. We're happy with how it looks. We want to start generating predictions to assist our churn retention process. Now, you can click into the Predict tab here. And um, this is going to allow you to, if you had a flat file of new records or, or, or new accounts that you wanted to score, say, hey, what, what's the likelihood that these customers are going to churn? You could do that right here on the screen. Um, but there's actually a couple different ways to deploy a model using Data Robot. You can use the GUI like we have here, the user interface. You could use the R or Python APIs for either batch or real-time predictions. Or if you'd like, you can even export this model. And um, I think uh, we had a question about that earlier. You can export the model via Python or Docker or Java scoring code. So um, there's a many different ways to export this model. And there's a concept in data science a lot of uh, bring the model to the data. You don't want to have your uh, model in a different 
uh, place than where your data is stored. Adding additional, uh, you know, technology stack requirements can kind of uh, make that a little bit of a slower process. And quite frankly, in some situations in machine learning, you're going to want instant predictions, real time predictions, and the ability to export models in many different ways, um, like like I mentioned, Docker. Python, uh, Java, there, there's a huge amount of power there in the ability to incorporate that um, raw code into whatever system uh, that you need to eliminate any latency if that is an issue for you. Um, hey, Ian, looks like Lance has another question. Okay, you, sir. Yeah. great question. All right, can we kick off a project through an API? Yes, or call from another system or like a data warehouse has completed update of data ingestion. Yes, absolutely. So um, one thing I will mention is that we have a, uh, a, a integration with Apache Airflow. So if you wanna orchestrate that type of um, you know, pipeline, you could absolutely do that. Uh, via the API, you can uh, kick off a modeling project. You can send data to a deployed model to generate inference. All of the visualizations that I showed today, you can access all of that via the API as well. So we have the ability to um, leverage many different ways to uh, kick off the scoring process of new data. And Lance, to your point here, um, you know, could we, you know, have this done in an outside system? The ability to export the code in many different ways allows you to control that. So if you want, you can absolutely uh, kick that process off via uh, manual scoring code or um, where we're actually going next in this demo is ML ops. But yes, Lance, we can we can do all of that. Um, so hopefully uh, it, it sounds like you have an idea about how you want to start using this in your in, in your workflow. So I'm interested mm -hmm. to uh, I'm interested in your line of thought there. Um, OK, so for uh, back to the demo. Um, we are at the process of actually deploying this model. We, we can drag new data here to score it. Um, but what I want to show you is the ability in Data Robot to actually deploy this model so it can be monitored over time. So um, here, if we navigate to the deploy option here, um, we have the ability to set up a new deployment. Um, and actually, uh, that will essentially set up a model deployment that we can monitor over time. And what this looks like um, in, in data science is, is, you know, this is a very common theme in data science. And the, the most recent stats that I heard were that about only 15% of uh, models that are built in, in industry actually make it into production. And the ones that do make it into production, only 1% of them are tracked in terms of what is going on with them as they make predictions over time. And part of the reason why this is, is because it's very frequently two different worlds of building models, which is more traditionally data scientists, and then deploying those models, which is more traditionally DevOps or data engineering. And those different personas might use different programming languages or tech stacks, and that can add to the difficulty in getting models into production. But for our e-commerce example today, it's very important to monitor and understand our model's health over time. If there are all of a sudden new items or new promotion types or a loyalty program data point that the model hasn't seen before and it didn't train on, the new model predictions that are generated those might be suspect. And the business value here is if that churn model starts failing to accurately predict if someone will churn or not, that's a material risk to the business. And that's a situation that might, might require a model rebuild or replacement. Now, a lot of other solutions out there are completely lacking when it comes to tracking models after they have been built. But putting models into production, that is part of the machine learning lifecycle. And using Data Robot and MLOps, we have easy ways to um, get everybody a uh, eyes and ears on all the different models that we have deployed. So I'm now going to navigate to the MLOps dashboard. And um, this is showing us all of our different deployed models. And I want to draw your attention to these three particular high-level metrics here, um, as they will give you a good understanding of how your model is performing in production. The first is service health. And service health is going to track metrics about a model deployment's ability to respond to prediction requests quickly and consistently. Next is data drift. 
And data drift is a calculation of how the incoming data for prediction differs from the data that was actually used to train the model. And finally is accuracy. ML ops can actually associate the real world outcome um, and compare that with the predictions made from the model. So eventually when we do know on maybe a monthly or a quarterly basis, which customers churned, we can upload that outcome data to data robot and then compare, and it will show you how accurate your predictions are compared to the, um, compared to the real world data. Now, it's not just the ability to monitor here um, in, in MLOps. You also want to be able to notify somebody if some model performance degrades below a certain threshold. And I promise you, whenever model you do, uh, do deploy, that model will degrade over time. It's just a fact of life in models. Um, you have, you're going to want to have the ability to take action when you do see that degradation event. And here you can set up approval workflows um, to, to ensure that the proper people um, have access to approve those models. You can see here one model on the leaderboard. Um, it, it says that this needs approval. And this is a situation where what we might have, um, oops, sorry about that. Uh, we might have somebody who um, has built that model, but they need to have a data scientist or perhaps a machine learning engineer um, look at that model before they can actually deploy it into production. And actually, if you try to um, generate predictions with data robot that on a deployment that needs approval, it will give you in the CSV file that you can download, it will say in that file, this is a non-approved model. So it really gives you a huge amount of power for uh, getting access to um, the, the uh, the models in production. And let's click into our deployed version of this retail churn model here uh, to show you kind of what this looks like. So we have our endpoint here. We have our model that was deployed from the leaderboard. Um, and we have our service health, our data drift, and our accuracy metric. If we click service health, you can see that there's a little warning here. And if we investigate this, it really, um, this was my mistake, actually. I uploaded the wrong data sets to this deployment, and it says we don't have any of the features here. So um, this will give you a good example of you know, the, the latency of how fast these predictions can um, be read, how many consumers of the model, how many model predictions have been made, and so on and so forth. Now, next, we have data drift. And data drift is going to show that comparison of how the incoming data for prediction differs from the model used um, to train. And if we did have any drift here, we could investigate that on a feature by feature standpoint. And then finally, we have model accuracy. Um, we can see here that um, our accuracy over time is uh, quite good. And we have a green status here for our accuracy. And the predicted versus actuals aren't differing so much here. So this is a great sign. And one thing I'd like to mention and emphasize is you can control the thresholds for drift and accuracy. So if you are not too worried about drift, you could even turn it off if you wanted, but you can absolutely adjust the thresholds here. Now. Why do we deploy a model? Well, we want to be able to easily score new data, and we want to be able to track that over time. So if we go to the predictions section, um, we have a number of different ways to actually um, make predictions. We can drag a CSV file uh, right in here and create a depth. Uh, we, we can uh, score that new data just in a flat file way. Um, we could leverage the prediction API so um, here, let's say we wanted to do real-time prediction. Um, Data Robot generates all of the Python code for you automatically. You don't have to write any of this yourself. It's going to have all the error checking built in. And essentially, all you need to do is provide it a CSV of your data. And all of this is generated for you automatically, specific to this churn problem that we're trying to solve. We also have the ability to create a job definition. So let's say we had a cadence that we want to pull uh, a data source from Snowflake, and then we score that data, and then we want to write it back to Snowflake. Here, we can add a job definition to set that orchestration up. So if we wanted to, um, we could say, I want you to take this prediction source, and I want you to write it to this different prediction source. We have the ability to do that, as well as establish a 
cadence for doing that. So if anybody is familiar with a uh, Linux cron job or a scheduled uh, Windows task scheduler job, um, this is essentially replicating that process here. Um, so um, in addition to the, uh, the ways to make prediction, we also offer the champion challenger framework. So sometimes you deploy a model, and I'm going to go back to the model deployments here. Sometimes you deploy a model and you want to see what could have been with some of the other models that are on the, uh, on the leaderboard. If I click into a model here with challengers, um, what you see is, um, and this will take a sec to load, but essentially you have your champion model, which is the one that is currently deployed. And then you have challenger models, and those are tracked alongside the champion in this deployment. And we can see here that one of our, uh, one of our models, this max accuracy model, it's actually 34% more accurate than the model that we have deployed. This is a situation where we might say to ourselves, well, hey, there is a model out there and it's tracking along with this champion model. We wanna swap this challenger model that's 34% more accurate into the, ch into the champion position. And all you would have to do is navigate over to this action section and swap that model into uh, production there with no downtime. This is extremely helpful. So if you have a model degradation event, or if you see a reason to use another model, for example, the accuracy is much higher in this case than the champion model, you can easily swap that in, make that kind of governance event known there. And all of that uh, governance event, any change in models um, is, is tracked in the log section. So you can see that we haven't had any model swaps here, um, but maybe, you know, eventually there might be a, a, a model swap done there. Maybe we want to even uh, retrain the model from scratch. There's a lot of different directions you go here. Um, and, and really, MLOps is valuable because it allows for flexibility in where you develop your models, as well as preventing vendor lock-in. One last feature I want to mention about MLOps is that you can also bring models from other sources and you can monitor them all in the single pane of glass. So if you have built models in a Jupyter Notebook, or you maybe have a deployed model in SageMaker, or maybe you're using SAS Enterprise Guide, or you have something that you have uh, stored in a version control system like GitHub, you can leverage MLOps and to monitor those models, regardless of where they were deployed or what tech stack you used. And finally today, I want to introduce you to Pathfinder. Pathfinder is DataRobot's free online resource that has hundreds of different AI use cases here in many different customer verticals. So if you are working with a customer who operates in retail, just type in retail into Pathfinder, and that is going to suggest for you uh, many different use cases specific to that vertical. Um, now, there are a lot of different use cases in Pathfinder, and really this is a very important resource because everybody wants to get going with AI, but sometimes you just don't know what is possible with AI. Pathfinder bridges that gap to share stories about what is possible with AI, as well as notebooks and data examples and app examples as well. Not only do you get an overview of these different applications of AI, but you also in many cases get a detailed description of um, how these AI solutions help drive business value. Now we worked through a churn use case today, but um, maybe we want to do a different retail use case like demand forecasting or predicting next best offer or maybe something like customer lifetime value. Um, there's a lot available in here, so I really encourage everybody to go and check it out. Um, and at this point, we're at the end of our demo. So let me circle back to my original question. On a scale from one to five, what is everybody's familiarity with Data Robot at this point? Is it, is it still at a one or did we do a little bit of learning today? If everybody could type into chat uh, that one to five number, that would be helpful. Hey, five Chris, plus, uh, wow. <laughs> hey, Chris, while we're allowing everybody to respond, I noticed in the deployed models, there was an importance setting. How, how does that get uh, set? So when you, or critical. that's a great question. Okay, so 
just uh, one sec, I'm seeing a lot of threes in chat. So I'm glad that I was able to um, educate people today about what's going on in data robot. Really appreciate, um, mm -hmm. really appreciate everybody there. Um, and to, to circle back to your question, if we go to the model leaderboard and we want to actually uh, set up a new deployment, um, we can answer a bunch of questions here, but really once we create a deployment, it's gonna ask you um, what the importance is. And if this is mission, if this model is mission critical to your organization, really assigning critic, critical status is going to associate more uh, hardware resources that will pivot to this deployment should anybody else be doing something like model training or there's other predictions being made. So really, it allows you to identify the most important models so that there's no downtime there. Thank you. Sure. Well, um, at this point, I'm really happy uh, that I got the chance to share the demo of Data Robots AI Cloud with you today. And at this point, um, let's open it up to any other questions that you may have. That was awesome, Ian. You're so good at this. <laughs> Thank you very much. Because you, you got the you got the data brain, but also you explain it in such an easy to follow way. I appreciate that. Mm -hmm. All right, as we're seeing if any um, last questions come in, I did want to just drop um, a link into the chat. This is the link if anybody is so inspired from the uh, conversation today that they want to get in there and start playing around themselves. This is the link that you can follow to do that. Um, I know that I can repost this, um, the data set link that you shared as well, Ian, so that they have a uh, kind of double Double the fun, getting in there. Perfect. Yeah, I don't see any questions coming through, but I wanna um, give you a heartfelt thank you. Like I said, this is an event that we've been waiting for for a while now, and you are a, a fabulous presenter. And I personally feel like I've got a, a much better idea of how the platform um, works. Oh, and Lance does have a question. So do awesome. you, wanna, you wanna shout it out, Lance, if you unmute yeah. uh, yourself? Yeah, we have data in a data mart and we need to build tying tables for that data to be able to consume or sell it um, to the open market. Um, for instance, uh, in geospatial modeling or in the fed data, um, can we output tables directly to a data warehouse so that instead of the model having to churn through billions of records, it actually has a data set that it can go to that says yes, yes, no. Uh, based on certain uh, models that we use. Yes, absolutely. You can you can absolutely set that up. And downsampling is built right into the platform. So if you have a giant data set, Data Robot is going to automatically downsample that and try many different approaches there to um, be able to create a good model not using all of that massive amounts of data. That's a really common problem where you have a giant data set and you don't exactly know you know how much data you need to build a good model. Uh, a lot a lot of that um, automatic determination is built right into the platform, including downsampling there. And yes, we can also pipe that to uh, external data source. Let's say you wanted to clean that data up and you know isolate that training data in, in order to uh, determine the subsample there. You can absolutely pipe that back to uh, you know a database of your record there. Well, what I mean, what I mean by that would be, um, let's see, in a geospatial model, I have a store and I have some on east west routes and some on north south routes. Sure. And I'm interested in um, sun, sun, sun in the eyes for sunglasses, east west would be probably the probably the model that I'd want to take a look at sure. and, and say, hey, strategically, I believe I want to test if east west sales are higher than north south on certain on certain turnpikes or freeways. Um, can I create a, a data output that says 1.5% for uh, this location, 8.2% or whatever, yes or no? Yeah, um, yeah, absolutely. I mean, mean, really what you're getting at there is kind of like a t-test, right? Determining yep. the, the difference between two different populations there. You can yep. absolutely replicate that using the API for sure. Sweet, thank you. Sure thing. Last call for questions. <laughs> That's about it. This that was, was an awesome job, Ian. Thank you so <laughs> thank much. Thank you, Ian. As always, Ian. Thank well, thank you. you. And Great Nicole, thank your you. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks everybody. everybody. Have a good one. Have a good one. All right, everybody. Have a great day. Bye. Bye-bye.